Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm Elizabeth Packhead. I'm from the Palm Beaches region here in South Florida. And my co-coordinator, Patty Woodall, is struggling to get on. I, we're having some technical issues. Um, just a reminder, you know, the 2020 virtual conference starts October 9th to the 11th on Jane's Juvenilia, Reason, Romanticism, and Revolution. It's $89 for members to sign up. And you know, when you sign up for that, you have 30 days to watch the presentations. You don't have to watch them on that three-day weekend. Um, and our speaker today, Susan Jones, is actually one of the breakout speakers. She's going to be speaking on mocking of the home. Maybe she can say a couple words about that before she starts her uh, leading into the discussion today on engagements in Jane Austen's novels. So I'm going to give it over to Susan. I'm going to mute myself. I, I, um, the paper I'm giving at the, and, and actually it's been recorded already. Someone's cleaning it up, thank heavens. Uh, is on the mocking of home in which I make the claim that uh, the juvenilia is a place that uh, Jane Austen uh, practices and then later mines for different aspects that she uses in her later novels so that some of the characters, for example, some of the situations, um, she's going back and using what she learned when she was a young person writing farces for her family and um, and then I talk about the places where I see that happening. So um, it was kind of fun to write. And uh, I am going to talk about one of those early works today when I talk about engagements. Because, of course, in Jane Austen, a person could become engaged, that is, a lady could become engaged, through a wide variety of qualities. For example, she could be beautiful, and that would cause her to become engaged. Or... She could be wealthy, and that would cause people to be attracted to her. Or she could have great accomplishments. Or she could be really amiable. Or she could be really cunning. So, um, and there are many other ways. Jane Bennett, of course, is beautiful. Emma has money as well as beauty to recommend her. Jane Fairfax is accomplished. She's so accomplished that everybody remarks on it all the time. Lucy Steele and Charlotte Lucas are a little on the cunning side, Lucy Steele especially. And Lady Susan, if you want to go back a little further, she's beautiful and cunning. But remember that when cunning people finally get engaged to and marry, they don't necessarily have the happiest of endings. The one thing that all these ladies have in common is that, of course, they can't pop the question. They have to be asked. Henry Tilney says, man has the advantage of choice, woman the power of refusal. In the Juvenilia, I wanted to start out with a Frederick and Elfrida, which has rapidly become one of my fondest of the early works. There are numerous engagements. It's very silly. <coughs> it's 12 pages. First, there's Frederick and Elfrida. They're so alike that it appears they belong together from the very first line. And we're told, the parents of Frederick proposed to those of Elfrida, which being accepted with pleasure, the wedding clothes were bought and nothing remained to be settled but the naming of the day. So um, this is a very peculiar proposal because one set of parents proposes to the other set of parents and the uh, principles really aren't a part of that. No choice, no refusal. And then uh, a character named Charlotte goes to London. She's, she's one of those characters who likes to please everybody. And while she's sitting at her hostess's house, an old man comes in. We're told he has a sallow face and an old coat. And he asks her to marry him. She just can't turn him down because she doesn't want him to be disappointed. So she says yes. And then a young man comes in as soon as the old one's gone. And he proposes, and she says yes to him too, because she doesn't want him to be disappointed. Um, she can be too amiable. And uh, she gets so wrought over having accepted two proposals, she drowns herself. And then uh, the daughters of Mrs. Fitzroy are, enter the scene, and Jezelinda, the daughter who is beautiful, but in a very um, artificial way, runs off with the coachman. Well, so we don't know what that proposal looked like. 
And then Rebecca is um, asked for in marriage, but her mother says no because she says the couple are too young and Rebecca is 36 and her, her uh, fiance is 63. But a week later, the mother is um, willing to have them marry because um, someone bribes her with a scent bottle, actually probably smelling salts. So even uh, Fre Frederica and uh, Elfrida have an obstacle because the one thing that remains is that somebody has to name the wedding day and she doesn't want to do it. And then when she finally does, he says he won't be married that day. Eventually, she has a series of fainting fits, which brings Frederick to toe and they do get married in the end and one presumes live happily ever after. All is in 12 pages. So obviously uh, Jane Austen slows down later on and in the more fully developed novels there are fewer proposals and a greater amount of development. But the man still has agency. The woman really doesn't get to make the proposal Hello, we're a little suspicious of Lucy Steele and how she got that proposal out of Edward. John Mullen points out that a man has a better chance of having a proposal accepted if he does it outdoors. And um, think about all those failures indoors. Think about Mr. Elton in the carriage. Think about Mr. Collins. Also, he says, if the man thinks he's irresistible, he's very likely to get a no. If he fears he's going to be rejected, he's more likely to get a yes. So women have to wait to be asked and men have to ask. This is why there's such a lengthy period of time in which Eleanor in Sense and Sensibility is wondering what Edward's problem is. She knows he likes her, but he never says anything. And then finally, Lucy Steele comes along and reveals that they're they're, they have a secret engagement. But, and of course, secret engagements were frowned upon for a wide variety of reasons. And not the least is the one that Emma mentions is that it, that it really destroys the social fabric because they're sailing under false colors and nobody knows exactly how to treat them or what to say. Edward can't break his engagement because he's an honorable man. And Mullen says also, there's always a threat of breach of promise, of a legal action. If an honorable man breaks his engagement, he could be sued. So when he makes that speech and wants to be engaged, he has to do it carefully, outdoors preferably, and with a certain sense of humility. So what does the man say? We don't hear a lot about the successful uh, speeches of proposal. Um, Jane Austen says uh, something like, oh, he said something that was appropriate, or there's never really a, a lengthy description. But we do hear about the ones that aren't accepted. Mr. Collins says, allow me to assure you that I have your respected mother's permission for this address. You can hardly doubt the purport of my discourse, however your natural delicacy may lead you to dissemble. My attentions have been too marked to be mistaken. Of course, Elizabeth Bennett's horrified by this point. Almost as soon as I entered the house, I singled you out as the companion of my future life, once he found out the oldest daughter was engaged. But before I am run away with by my feelings, perhaps it will be advisable for me to state my reasons for marrying. Well, that probably wasn't a really good idea because they aren't very promising. First, he says clergymen should marry and set an example for the parishioners. Secondly, he says it will add to his happiness, making no mention of hers. And third, Lady Catherine advised it. So none of this is very flattering and he gets turned down. Darcy's first proposal, in vain have I struggled, it will not do. My feelings will not be repressed. You must allow me to tell you how ardently I admire and love you. Why has he been repressing them? Why doesn't he want to ask her? I mean, this is not very flattering either. And then, he, then she really finds out that she's not at all happy. So a successful proposal must obviously be humbler and more appropriate. 
not self-assured and not ignorant like Mr. Collins. And I guess a man wants to have a pretty good idea that someone will say yes and not be in this false state of thinking that no one would turn him down. We don't hear Darcy's uh, second proposal in full, but we know it's appropriate. And with these men of honor like Knightley and Darcy, we know they will be utterly shattered if that final proposal is turned down. In fact, we don't know what Captain uh, Wentworth says, but he does write something that's probably one of the roman most romantic things in all of Jane Austen when he writes, you pierce my soul. I am half agony, half hope. Who would not accept him? I'd accept him. Wish he lived on my street. So what's the etiquette leading up to the proposal? <laughs> I'd be bringing pies. First, a couple is never allowed to be alone. They want to make sure that everything is on the up and up. Second, the man has to court the appropriate daughter. He can't go after the younger one if the older one has not been spoken for. And that could cause the younger ones to have to wait a while. Mostly the younger girls were not brought out until the older daughter has had some kind of opportunity to find a husband. And eventually, obviously, life goes on because that happens for um, Anne Elliot. Her sister never manages to make the match. Secondly, a man can't just stand in the street and talk to a woman. This is considered very inappropriate. However, if she indicates that his attentions are welcome, he can act as her protector and walk her from one place to another. And in many cities, a woman needed a protector to uh, keep her from getting splashed by unpleasantness or uh, having her pocket picked. So, um, so that would be okay. Unless they were engaged, a couple could only dance two sets together. So if they did any more than that, that was considered to be a sign that they were, were definitely engaged. And there was to be no exchange of personal letters. And we know that at least two of our heroines transgress this, that Marianne sends letters and everybody thinks she's engaged. And Catherine Moreland, her parents let her send letters um, which obviously means they, they consider her and Henry Tilney as good as engaged, even though there are some obstacles in the path. There's no conversing privately. There's no being alone in a room together. There's no traveling in a carriage unescorted, which is probably why Mr. Elton takes that moment he thinks perhaps she's showing him partiality as opposed to it's being an accident. No calling of Christian names, no first name calling, always Miss Bennett, Miss Elizabeth Bennett, but not Elizabeth. Gentlemen must always be introduced to the lady. They just couldn't come up and force themselves on someone. It's an honor to meet her. She's the one that has the value. He's the one that has to propose. And no young lady should indulge in socially inappropriate behavior because she could lose her reputation forever. Mary Ann um, has a really serious problem in this respect. And everyone is deeply shocked when an engagement isn't forthcoming and when he goes off and finds himself a, an heiress and uh, shuns Mary Ann, whom he has previously seemed to court, whom he's given or wanted to give really expensive gifts to. All of those things would be inappropriate for a young woman who is not yet engaged. For many couples, the very first time they're actually alone together is when the proposal is made. Now, um, and when everybody feels he's going to come up to the mark, they shuffle them off into a room by themselves. And, and it can be either he's already spoken to her father or he's ascertaining her willingness and then he'll speak to her father, both for uh, could be done. Uh, notice that Mr. Collins asks mom, not dad. Why would he do that? 
we'll have to think about that. There's no engagement ring, not necessarily. There could be, if there were family jewelry, um, I suppose there could be an engagement ring, but it was not the style of the period for an engagement ring to be given. Uh, no diamond ring, no going out to the jeweler to get a diamond ring. Um, instead, uh, it was just the exchange of an understanding. However, rings were very popular in the Regency. And so very frequently, sentimental gifts were exchanged, not necessarily at the time of the engagement. And of course, uh, during the wedding, the man put the ring on the woman's finger with the words, with this ring, I thee wed. But he did not necessarily and probably didn't wear a wedding ring, but she wore one, making sure everybody knew she was his property. So if there were a token of affection being given, it could be a hair ring, like what we see Lucy Steele giving to Edward, or one of the most popular rings of that period was a locket ring, of, of which many were made. And the locket ring had been popular ever since the Renaissance. Sometimes people call them poison rings after Lucrezia Borgia. But in fact, they didn't contain poison. They often contain a miniature portrait of the person who gave the ring. And then during the, the Regency, when silhouettes became A, cheap and B, popular, um, you could put a silhouette in, which cost you a whole lot less than having a miniature done. And someone would wear that on their finger. And, and even um, figures in power would have rings with their pictures in them that which they would give to people. I suppose following the um, example of Elizabeth I who had miniatures of herself given, given to other people. So uh, very often people would have or exchange locket rings um, and it, would, it, could, it could also have the image of the eye, which I'm sure you've all seen in jewelry of that period. So it could be you look in and the eye is watching you could have a lock of hair in there. And, and later on, those locket rings also became um, memento mori, funeral uh, exchanges, things that you gave to people in, in memory. Rings were so fashionable in the Regency that and when people were going out to public occasions, um, big balls and things, they often wore multiple rings, one on every finger or um, maybe several. So uh, the <laughs> it sounds a little flashy to me. I'm sure Elizabeth Bennett never wore multiple rings, but uh, if you were really rich and you wanted to show it, you could wear those multiple rings and um, demonstrate your popularity, I suppose, if you were given them, and be your wealth. So uh, it's possible that even though you didn't get an engagement ring, you could have a sentimental ring from the person. Uh, women more often wore those rings than men. And uh, either could wear a locket ring, but no diamond ring exchanged, no uh, big business for the diamond people as they have today. So once you had the affirmation, you went right to business because as Patty explained, you had to have all of those business documents signed before the wedding. You had to secure money to the uh, to the woman after and uh, give her her dowel rights and her pin money, whatever she needed uh, in case there was an untimely death. And even remember Cassandra Austin received a bequest. She was engaged and when her fiance died, she did receive a bequest uh, from him and from his estates. Engagements were generally speaking, not long. Uh, several characters speak against long engagements as being not very suitable. And when, especially when a young man was a clergyman and was trying to find his way to a profitable living, uh, it could be a very long time before he got out of being a curate and, and could make his way to where a family was affordable. And, and uh, it's generally frowned upon. They really wanted young people, once they were engaged, to move as quickly as was legally and religiously possible um, according to your financial abilities, to the, um, to the marriage itself. And um, 
you would have to post bans or you would have to have a special license um, or you'd have to run off to Scotland, depending on. I suppose friends could exchange rings, uh, but rings were often from admirers. You, but but I, I'm sure that people exchange rings just out of friendship as, as they might today. So generally there was a short time between the engagement and the wedding. So you waited and waited and waited for the proposal. And then you waited for the financial arrangements. And then you waited for the bans and then the marriage. And then one would like to presume you lived happily ever after. So I have some questions for you. Which one of those engagements do you think was the most romantic? Well, I'm going to just jump right in and say I'm in love with Wentworth. So yeah. for me, that was the most romantic and it's the story I relate to most, maybe because I'm over 60 and I've got road behind me. But um, I, I have a couple questions, Susan. First of all, do you have any idea when the engagement ring became the vogue? Did you read, see anything in your reading? I think a lot of the customs that we think of as marriage customs today come from uh, Victoria's wedding and, and the aftermath of Victorian wedding becomes the model for the 20th century wedding. The white dress, the big cake, et cetera, et cetera. None of that would have been uh, Regency practice. They wore a dress that would be practical to wear and could be any color. Uh, and my other question was, and, and anyone who wants to jump in, please do, because we only have um, 13 people in the meeting today. We can probably unmute unless it gets a little crazy. Um, uh, first of all, how did you ever get to know anyone if you couldn't exchange letters, you couldn't be alone with them, you couldn't really spend any time with them? So I guess you weren't supposed to really know the person you were getting engaged to. It was supposed to all be about their family background and it's a good match, right? When you would go to balls, that's oh. why you had to have a lot of friends and family so that you could travel around and you would go to um, different things. There would be family meetings in which you would be introduced to young men. Your brothers were at university, they brought their buddies home. I mean, there were all those kinds of ways, but they were all very connected. You didn't go out to a wine bar or you know all of the things that people could do today. Um, but instead, within a very sheltered environment, um, you would be introduced to people who were suitable and you went and visited your, your friend. If you went to a school, um, if you were a young woman, you could go home with one of your friends and meet the brothers. And um, so there were all kinds of connections, but they were very much uh, managed within a certain strata of society. They didn't want you running off with the coachman. It would be way too easy to meet. <laughs> Well, and also, and also remember, in their um, on their honeymoon, they often took someone with them because they had not conversed much, and uh, there was someone else to kind of break the silence or to keep the conversation going. And so, a lot of times, their honeymoons were a little, a little, you know, icy at first before they got to know one another. Right. Often they they had never really been much time together at all. I mean, they looked and admired and, and knew about the person's character, but asked for... Where did the expression honeymoon came from? They didn't use that term in Regency England, right? Susan? Well, I, I don't know whether they did or not, but um, it was, I, I think it was certainly a, a folk expression, at least as early as the Renaissance. And my last question, anybody else, I don't want to uh, uh, take over the conversation here. Um, the man was supposed to ask permission of the girl's father first, correct? Right. And well, sometimes they actually ascertained whether they had, whether there was going to be a positive result before they, they felt out the territory before they asked the father. Kathleen says, as an ammo. Kathleen, I'm going to unmute you if you would like to say something here. 
I don't know why I can't unmute. Oh, here she is, Kathleen. We can hear you. Can we? No, Kathleen, I unmuted you, but I don't know why I can't hear you. Huh? We've had some technical difficulties in this meeting. <laughs> Julia, did you have a hard time getting on? Yes, I was toggling between my tablet and the phone. It kept signing me in and then it wouldn't accept my sign in. Okay. I have to, yeah. Now, so I just have the meeting. We're going to try to work that out for next month. Okay. We 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 book the meeting a little differently this month and I think it caused some problems. Okay. Uh, Anybody else want to talk about their favorite proposals in the novels? Karen, I know you have something to say. Um, I listened to Jim Nagel's talk yesterday on inheritance, and you know he talked a lot about. He said there's a misconception that women don't inherit anything, but women could inherit private property, just as in nothing that something that wasn't attached to the land, like clothing and belongings. So, it, thinking of a dowry. Susan, what did you learn about a dowry for, for these engagements? How much was a family really expected to put forward? It would depend on what the man wanted. Depend, I mean, that was a bargain. I mean, sort of like goats or pigs. You know, what did he want? What did he, I mean, some of them couldn't have accepted a small amount because they themselves were poor. So they had to go after someone who was, um, very wealthy. Doesn't Willoughby marry the, the, the man that he, the woman he goes after, doesn't she have 50,000 pounds? Something like that. So um, that's a high, he couldn't, he couldn't afford with his expensive taste to have someone who had a very small amount of money attached to her. So it, it would, it would be depending upon the status and, and the wealth of the man and also that of the woman because Darcy See who's immensely wealthy. I don't, you know, he's not going to get much with Elizabeth Bennet because there's not you much made there. Good point. Uh, very often, the pin money a woman would be allowed was negotiated before the wedding day, too, right? Right. That was usually in the settlements. Sort of like a prenup. Yeah, well, and there was also there was also a, like a life insurance policy that that she could get as well. Um, I don't think Mrs. Dashwood got got much at all, you know, with hers because of the son. Well, but the money that her husband had had come from the son's mother. Son's mother so right. the money right. was going back to him. It didn't really belong to the husband except that he had the use of it for his lifetime. So and when, and he, his estate was entailed, correct? He didn't actually own that. That's no, the estate was entailed yeah. to the eldest son. Plus, there was money that had come from the first wife that went to her son and couldn't go to the daughters. Right, right. So it was very complicated. It was. <laughs> well, when you think about men and women weren't supposed to be alone together, it was fairly shocking that Mr. Elton and Emma were in that carriage alone together. Yeah, that was an oversight. Uh, it was an accident. And um, very unsettling accident at that. <laughs> she could have gotten out of that carriage pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> she could have. I mean, she, she was in some kind of danger because if he really was drunk, mm -hmm. um, he certainly could have assaulted her. Now, Harriet was supposed to be there originally, but right. she got sick. So with Harriet gone, then it's just the two of them. Kathleen's having a, a, a problem, I think, with her audio, but she just wrote, do people think that the Eleanor Edward narratively indirect proposal is romantic? The name misunderstanding, Eleanor asking how the new Mrs. Edward Ferrars is, the clarification, Eleanor rushing out the door and audibly crying, Edward wandering off, etc. Any comments there, Susan? I don't know. What do you think about Edward? He's not exactly the most forceful fiance anybody ever got. And he's allowed himself to be seduced or suckered into an 
an engagement with Lucy Steele, who is certainly one of um, Austin's most predatory females. And then, of course, she dumps him for his brother. But. I don't see anything romantic in him at all, personally. <laughs> but she, excuse me, she did. <laughs> so I guess that's all that counts. That's right. But I don't find it a very romantic uh, proposal either. Kathleen, what do you think? She's having an issue with her audio. She's not she muted. Can us. We can't hear her. She can write us. Yeah, she can write us. <laughs> he w he would not have been. I I thought he was a kind of weak character and not. I would have liked Eleanor to have someone nicer. Well, and Stephanie just made it. Oh, me, Kathleen just wrote good point. So it's romantic for her, but he's just going from being influenced by one strong woman to another. <laughs> to another. That's very true. Was the engagement outdoors? That's the question, Stephanie says. She doesn't remember. I don't remember either. Kathleen? <laughs> it, it, it was indoors. It was indoors. It was indoors. Was it indoors? Yes. That's but, one of the yeah. ones that actually succeeds indoors <laughs> but, <even reasonable. laughs> but it certainly winds up the book quickly right it's a really <laughs> fast one Kathleen writes I think he wanders off and then comes back and they clarify but they don't see the proposal we don't see the proposal directly um, doesn't Knightley propose to Emma outdoors yes. yes that one's beautiful I love the line where he says something like I would say, if I didn't love, I, I would say less if I didn't love you more. Yeah. That's such a beautiful line. All the proposals were outside. Darcy's outside. Yeah. Was Darcy's outside? His second one was outside. Outside. His second one was outside. Doesn't when, well, she accepts Wentworth outside in the street, correct? Mm -hmm. Right. On the gravel walk. Right. Jane and Bingley indoors, says Kathleen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think part of the reason they're outdoors is that's the only time they had privacy. When they right. were indoors, they were in, in company. So they had to wander off into the shrubbery <laughs> if they wanted a chance to talk to each other privately. <laughs> Very true. Without anybody seeing what they were up to. <laughs> Yeah. Well, no one, no one ever kisses anybody. There's, there is oh, no. no kissing. No, I think um, social historians have written that the first time a woman is often kissed is on her honeymoon. It comes as a is, is that what they call social distancing? Yeah, <laughs> it was really social distancing. That would have been pretty bad if he was a bad kisser too, and you were stuck with him the rest of your life. You know? Right. Well, no. I mean, I can certainly understand why Jane didn't get married. I mean. And I'm thinking about the talk again I heard yesterday about how you can go into a marriage as a woman with a million dollars, but the day you get married, you have nothing and everything goes right. to your husband and you have no worth any longer. So right. why would you ever want to get married? Huh? Not that Jane had money, but I can kind of see why a wooden woman wouldn't get married. Wow. Well, that's what Emma says. She doesn't have to get married because she has money. Mm -hmm. So she's in a position to... I was wondering about that. How did Emma have money? Most women didn't have money. Well, they could receive it privately from their mother, or if their mother was passed away, or from collection. And, and Emma wasn't the oldest either. She was the younger daughter. Mm -hmm. She but had she could an have older been sister. been the favorite of some relative who left her money. I think that happens in Clarissa. And... Um, she has some money that's come from some collateral relative. So you could get money that was sent to you, was given to you um, in the estate of some relative, your favorite aunt. Um, had... Oh, I think Kathleen just dropped out. Sound just came on from me. I think it did. That's interesting. Um, also, well, we can hear you, Kathleen. Well, I've come back to haunt you all. <laughs> Welcome. It's good to hear your voice. It's the ghost of Austinites past. Yeah. Um, 
No, I was saying it was good to hear your voice, but I missed your cucumber sandwiches. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Karen. That you're the only one who misses my food. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not true. Now, in my mom, if Hartfield was that the name of the estate? Okay. Yes. If that was Emma. owned outright by Emma's father. He could have left it to anyone he wanted, right? If he had purchased it, yes, he could. Okay. It was entailed, it would have to go to the next male relative. Correct. But if he owned it outright, he could leave it to his daughters. Yeah, whatever he wanted to do with it. But the narrator does make clear that uh, Emma's aware that her male nephew is next in line if she doesn't have a son. And there's a little tongue-in-cheek moment in the narration where, you know, she sort of pretends to care about uh it pretends to care about her nephew's future or something like that i forget what the phrasing is does anybody remember but yeah, then of course Aries, mr knightley uh, john flabby isn't she say again isn't that about don well abby it's not about her father's mm -hmm. right yeah i think so Oh, is it? Oh, I thought it was about Hartfield. But That's I right. If Mr. if Mr. Knightley doesn't marry, then, okay. then the estate would go to his brother and from his brother to his son. And that's what she was worried about. Do you all think that, and Susan, maybe you can comment on this. I've never understood whether that allusion implied that Emma is actually not as materialistic as, as she seems and is just kind of having a comical thought for her own amusement? Or does she genuinely think about, I want this estate? Because, you know, Elizabeth Bennett's that way. And I get the feeling that Emma's sort of pretending to care more than she does about who gets stuff. Yeah, I think and, she's joking. I think she's joking when she says that. Because, you know, when she realizes she loves Mr. Knightley, then if she has children, they're going to inherit. So, so it's kind of a moot point. Right. Yes, then it's too bad for little Harry. Yeah. Or yeah. Henry, whatever his name was. Whatever his name is. But really, that means she sincerely loves Mr. Knightley and is yeah. not thinking specifically of that. But, oh, it's convenient that that happens to work out for her. Right. But if they don't have children, it won't. Yeah. Or if they don't have male children. Right. Well, I'm thinking about sense and sensibility, Marianne was really lucky that um what's his name came and rescued her colonel brandon colonel brandon rescued her because she would her reputation was definitely going to be tainted yeah she had allowed herself to be swept carried. away swept now are these lessons that Jane is trying to teach people don't uh, the mistakes you can make in life I don't know. Do we know about Brandon's proposal? I don't remember. I don't think that's mentioned. I don't think we're told how, uh, but we're just told that eventually her heart was his. Uh, also, we're told that she's surprised he likes her. And I've never quite accepted that interpretation by the narrator that the news quote unquote bursts on her. That was obvious to everyone else uh, that, in fact, Colonel Brandon's always been in love with her, but she's been so busy being infatuated with Willoughby and, and the, the whole narrative she constructed around that. Uh, so it's sort of like, oh, he really is in love with me. And now she can be open to that and recognize that it's pretty cool for someone to like her that much now that she knows what it's like not to be genuinely cared for. But she acts surprised. The narrator claims she's surprised to discover he's in love with her and then he she's the reward uh the mother and the sister everyone gangs up on her and finally she succumbs it's kind of an odd way to phrase it but then we're told her whole heart's eventually his because she doesn't love by halves it's an odd thing i think some people are very disappointed because that doesn't follow a traditional romantic narrative uh but also i think she may discover he's the real romantic lover she's been looking for. It bothers me how very much older he is than she is. I can't, exactly. I can't believe it. He's only twice her age. <laughs> Just, d yeah, and, and he, yes, and after having such a romantic relationship with Willoughby, which it really was romantic and from the heart and 
they felt the same way about poetry and and then then she comes to this guy well he does love her but he doesn't have the same romantic qualities that her first love had too paternalistic yeah i, I just think he's way too old for her so I mean, can, you, is, can you imagine that third what he's 36 and she's 17. all right how about the question what is romance Wait, can I ask a, a question about this? Um, like something that I've always thought about and my mom have discussed, why didn't Colonel Brandon, he, he could marry the mother, they were more appropriate age. Exactly. He didn't want her. <laughs> they wanted the young one. <laughs> that, that always bothered me. That's a good point. Well, I do think that, in so, that, that this issue of, of older men and younger women marrying was pretty common in the time. And you and and men needed to have heirs, so um, they needed to marry younger women to produce children. Hmm. Well, then they should have gotten married when they were younger. <laughs> <laughs> well, as, as you recall, he had a series of false starts. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's true. Well, and actually, since we're talking about sense and sensibility, I believe that the Dashwood girl's father was significantly older than their mother. She was a yes. second marriage for him. Yes. Yes, he was. But again, I ask the question, what is romance? What is romance? Just a, the man is handsome and energetic? Or is romance more about dependability, reliability, someone who's going to be there for you, who cares, more about you than themselves? Well, I always thought Colonel Brandon was romantic, but maybe it's because I'm an old person. I don't know. <laughs> I always thought he was more romantic. I mean, Willoughby was a jerk, and and who knew what he was? Who knew if he was lying every time he's going to write the poem? I mean, even veracity was not his greatest forefront issue, and and he dragged her into a lot of situations where he knew that he'd be ruined. You know, running around the country, going off to a private house alone, no chaperone, no nothing. I mean, she, and, and he had compromised other women. Yes, he is. Old fish, that's for sure. And look at Wickham. He's portrayed as this dashing officer in a red jacket, a romantic character. But Wickham was a terrible person, too. Not really romantic when you really see him for what he is. Well, if you look at the definition of the Romantic era, it had to do with having a lot of emotion and beauty and feeling and things like that. Uh, so if you, you know, would connect it with that, it would be someone who had a lot of sensibility as, um, um, what's her name does? <laughs> I can't, my mind's Marianne. open right now. Marianne. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And from that point of view, Eleanor Dashwood has a great deal of sensibility, arguably more than Marianne. Uh, mm -hmm. just keeps it to herself more, mm -hmm. but she feels deeply and she has genuine sensibility in caring for and uh, feeling compassion and empathy for others as well. Um, that was wonderful. Does anyone have anything more to say about this topic? I wanted to say, I wanted to ask you whose proposal you thought was the most insulting. Oh. Darcy's. 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 Darcy's first Mr. one. Collins. Yeah, the first one. Well, Mr. Collins. <laughs> Mr. Collins is bad. Yeah. So poor Elizabeth, she's, she's the recipient of the two worst proposals. <laughs> On the other hand, she got the best proposal in the end. Yes, that is true. Mm -hmm. And you who would you have to turn down you. of these men? Hmm? Who would you have turned down? Yeah. Would you have turned down Edward Farrar's? Yes, as yes, Elizabeth. Yeah. Would you have turned down uh, Edmund in Mansfield Park after he'd been messing around with Mary Crawford? <laughs> <and> <laughs> no, wishy-washy. 
Yeah. They're both too, too in, easily influenced, kind of like Bingley in that sense. What, what do you think about cousins marrying each other? I mean, today I think that would be unheard of, but it was very common then, even in the royal families, especially in the royal families. I mean, wouldn't they have figured out genetically that it didn't work out very well? I mean, they probably had a lot of offspring who were defective in some way because because uh, two, two recessive genes for some bad disease were more likely in cousins than in non-cousins. Just like line breeding in dogs and cats, you could get a really strong characteristic that would be a little wonderful. Or on the other hand, a few generations later, you might end up with a lethal gene, but you wouldn't be around to say that. But what they did, know, what they did think about it was that it kept um, undesirable genes from coming into your family gene pool, and, and especially from people that you didn't know what their lineage was. And that was especially true of the Creole heiresses who were coming up from the Caribbean, uh, who were Europeans who had been born in places like Martinique, um, but they, they, they're not from here. So um, even though they had immense amounts of money and you occasionally had to marry a child off to them, uh, you still weren't too sure about their background. You'd rather have a cousin marriage than marriage to someone who you just weren't quite sure about. Well, I mean, the, the fact is they didn't understand how genetics worked. Right. So they... And it certainly, it certainly I mean, would have... Understood, they understood about incest. They didn't let siblings marry, but they didn't get that cousins had an awful lot, too much in common genetically because they didn't understand. Well, they did understand about breeding horses and dogs because they'd been doing that for a while. Mm -hmm. But um, human beings were a different story, I think. And, and um, they had a small circle, right? They had a small circle in their class group from which right. to choose. And there was a shortage of men. So there were other factors maybe too that contributed to you know, uh, encouraging you to choose from the men available in the general age range of your generation um, that were a suitable class. So that may have paid a, played a role. It's not like now where there's all these, you know, online groups and, and people are just considering, well, some people are considering large numbers of strangers. Um, but I did want to ask people if they think that it's still very relevant, the idea of, you know, meeting people within your community of connections only. Uh, and you know, through whether it's family, friends, or religious organizations, knowing someone's character. And if we remember, people really didn't know Willoughby very well. The Palmers didn't really know him. No one could, the, the um, uh, Sir John, you know, nobody really could vouch for his character. So even though he, yeah. he was known in a very surface way, um, he wasn't. So I'm just curious, uh, you know, I can't imagine just uh, those, those various online websites, but I've known people who've used them for dating. Uh, but I'm curious if that's still very relevant, staying within your network and really getting strong recommendations of character of, of a person before getting involved. Is that still relevant? People don't seem to focus on that. I, I don't know, and they should be careful. Like that, that show that was on TV based on a true story. Um, what was about the woman that met a man online in California 15 years ago? He said he was an anesthesiologist, and after she married him three months later, it was he was a psychopath mm -hmm. and a murderer, and he wasn't an anesthesiologist. So I can see where you want to stay in your own circle, but the world has expanded. I don't know. I, I, I'm not dating. I don't want to have anything to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. What do you think Regency people would think about the internet dating that people do now? Like in comparison, because they are like virtual strangers. They're not in like a circle. They're not like pre-approved by others. They would be appalled because on internet dating, so from what I hear, 
people are not telling the truth about what they do for a living, what, where they even live, whether they're married or single. There's just so much untruth going on on the internet. I can't see how that would, I mean, there's, we don't do a reading of the bands in church anymore. So how do you know somebody you're marrying is even single that you meet online? So I'm sure Jane would be appalled. What does anyone else think? I think that they would have thought it was okay for men and not so good for women. Because men will always roam around and do whatever would have been their reading of men. And women needed to stay close to home and have mom and dad pick out their husband. Susan, you mentioned the Creole heiress. Now, in Sandition, we have that character. Sanditon. Sanditon, I'm sorry. And, and um, so men wouldn't have had a problem in England marrying a Creole as long as she had a lot of money? No, well, a Creole did not necessarily mean a person of mixed race. Well, so, um, of mixed race in this character. It, it's, would have it, it meant someone who had been born in the Caribbean, but might have totally English ancestors. So, um, if if a director casts a person of color in that, that role, that that wouldn't necessarily have been what a Creole heiress was for um, for the period of time we're talking about. Just what makes it all very confusing. But it could have been. It could be one or the other, but it, not necessarily um, a person of color. So um, they still look down on them. And of course, money talks. So people married for money. Yeah. And then, but um, but if you weren't born in England, and and I one can only suppose to a certain extent if you were born in India, it uh, you were a woman and you were sent back to England. You would, they would have a different view of you than if you were born in Hamptonshire or something. Yeah. Hmm. All down to money. Yes. What does Stephanie say? I digress, but it's interesting that the Crawfords, when we first meet them, are described as okay, dark. As dark. Oh, well, they had a tan from being out at sea, right? Well, I don't think they were out at sea. Crawfords, Crawfords, Crawfords. I'm thinking of uh... the Crawfords. Mary Crawford and her brother. Oh, 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 Mary Crawford. I'm getting confused. I'm thinking of. Like, I think you were thinking of the Crofts and persuasion. Yeah. Crofts. Yeah, they, yeah, well, the Crofts. they just had dark, dark hair and dark eyes, mm -hmm. as opposed to having blonde hair and blue eyes. But they were attractive. Very attractive. Very attractive. Love it. And, and, and of course, poor um, uh, Edmund had his heart broken by Mary, who wouldn't have anything to do with a clergyman. Right. She didn't want a retired life. She wanted to live in London. She wanted to be rich. She wouldn't have been satisfied, and she let him know and broke his heart. When, Mary, when Maria ran off... What, who did she run off? What's the word? Henry. Henry. They used Henry. They used the word eloped. With Henry, but they, she was she was already married to Rushworth. Right, she was already married. So she couldn't really elope because she was already married. No, but that's the word that Jane Austen uses, elope. Right. But what on earth was she, was she actually thinking she could divorce Rushworth and marry him? Who knows? Hmm. I don't think she was thinking. <laughs> My goodness. Well, um, and I, I was going to kind of change the topic unless somebody had something else to say. Um, Susan mentioned some juvenilia at the very beginning of the meeting today. And you said your favorite of the juvenilia is? Frederick and Elfrida, because there's just so much going on and it's hilarious. And it's 12 pages. It's 12 pages. I don't know if you have read any of the juvenilia. I never have. I wouldn't even know where to begin. Is that a good beginning? Well, I guess Lady Susan, moving backwards, I think Lady Susan, if you've read Lady Susan, you're looking back into the early work because we don't exactly know when that was written. And um, then, I don't know, what are the, Catherine or the Bower? 
another long one. Is Lady Sue no, considered juvenile? That's in the early, that's in the juvenile, that's the early juvenilia, Lady Susan? I'm sorry? Is Lady Susan considered juvenilia? Not exactly, but it's on the cusp, and here's the problem. The, the copy that, according to um, the uh, editor, name just jumped out of my mind, um, it was, the copy we have was written when she was 20, but it's just a copy, so it's not the, it's not the original, so we don't know exactly when it was written. So they have a watermark that dates it, but, but there could have been an earlier version, in which case it could have been. But there you go. Now, I want to say, when I read Frederick and Elfrida, I just found myself laughing out loud. I know, it's hilarious. It's hilarious. And then I say, what, it's written by, what, a 16-year-old girl? Yeah. Love and friendship's a lot of fun, too. Love and friendship's fun. Well, the Oregon and yeah. Southwest Washington region is going to have a Zoom meeting about uh, Catherine or the Bauer. Right. Now, they rescheduled their meeting because of the fires in California. It was actually supposed to be today. But uh, they're going to be rescheduling that, I believe, for two weeks from today. And I printed it out, Catherine, in the back. You have to read it. Yes, it's been rescheduled for in two weeks. And that will be a very lively discussion because okay. you're going to have two opposite viewpoints, which I think will be fun. Right. It is going to be September 20th at 2 o'clock Pacific time. So that's 11 o'clock. Eastern time, correct? No, no, no. Yeah. Now, no, I think other way. Yeah, and I think it's the twenty seventh. I think it's been skipped. Stephanie, isn't it the twenty seventh that it's been? It was the twenty seventh. I'll check real yeah. quick. Oh, I got an email that said the twentieth. I I just got that September sixth. So we'll have to check that out. Yeah, but maybe we should get Marsha to clarify that, Stephanie. Because I have the passcode and everything, and it does say <coughs> September 20th. So that would be uh, 5 o'clock Eastern time on a Sunday. Wait, mine does say no, 27th. It's the 27th. <laughs> it says September 27th at 1 p.m. PDT. Correct. Oh, that's 4 o'clock our time. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> there's a lot of Zoom meetings. <laughs> but, um... We're going to play also, on. our practice in our Jazz Nest chapter to have a little social time at the beginning. So if, if 1 o'clock our time, 4 o'clock your time um, turns out to be too early for you, just jump in a little bit later because that's when we'll be getting into the meat of the program. Very good. Wonderful. Well, I apologize. And Stephanie's right. It'll be great. I apologize. People had a hard time getting in today. Um, we're gonna, I'll go back to book next meeting myself, and hopefully there won't be a problem next month. Now, next month is the virtual AGM. So we'll, we'll come up with the date, and I'll put it on our Facebook page. Is that how most of you are finding us? On no, I'm, I'm getting it from your emails. No, but I, I'm people that are not in our region. Are they um, I've been getting it from Marsha, who is in charge of our region. She's been amazing about sending out notices to our whole group. Okay, great, great. Um, and I will be coming up with a topic. We may do something about the significance of the piano and other instruments in her novels and the conversations and emotions around the piano. We'll see. That's good. All right, well, this was wonderful. I really want to have any parting words. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Yes, thank you, Susan. Thank you. Hearing Susan speak at the virtual 8 p.m. in October. And uh, I'm getting ready to sign up. Now, if you want to participate and sign up at $89 for the virtual AGM, you have until the end of this month. So, uh, you know, because it's virtual or online, you can sign up 10 days before. But you right, and if you, if you look at the 30th. If you, li if you yeah. listen or you watch the Zoom at the time it's scheduled, usually there'll be a time to talk after the presentation, so. Right. Right. Uh, will, will people be able to get a recording of this session? 
Today will be on Facebook in a few days. Mo uh, Monica will get that on Facebook. Okay. Thank you for attending, everyone. It's nice seeing you. Thank you Especially Kathleen, we haven't seen you in ages. <laughs> it's great to connect. Thanks, and sorry for the struggle with my computer. <laughs> well, it might have been on our way with the problem, so. Thanks, Susan. That was great. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye.